So these workshops are brought to you by the First Nations Education Council in collaboration with uh, the Health and Social Service Commission. And um, we're just doing this to make sure that, uh, you know, the, the importance of play today is the main topic where we'll be concentrating on just that with Eva de Godstini and Lena Klugstin. And uh, today we have a special, uh, a special person that's coming in today to, to do a, her part in, the, in playing attachments. So we're welcoming Sarah Cleary. And uh, Valerie is always there for support. So if there's any questions, you can you know, there I email myself, uh, Valerie Fortin, or Lena and Eva. Thank you very much. So take it away, Eva. Well, I'll let Sarah introduce herself and then I will introduce myself as well. I'm a counselor um, in language and culture at FNEC, but I'm so uh, I'm also a two-spirit person, uh, an artist, a mom, a hunter, gatherer, uh, working to really reconnect with my uh, spirituality, also with the language. Uh, and really focusing on uh, re relearning the know-how, the values um, in my everyday uh, with my family, with myself and my colleagues. So here I'll present a little bit about play. <laughs> Good, and we're looking forward to that, Sarah. So I'm Eva D'Agostini. Um, I am a, a psychologist, a child psychologist, and. I um, am a presenter of the material that uh, is or a paradigm or a thought way of thinking that is uh, is created by a Canadian psychologist called Dr. Gordon Newfeld. And uh, the presentation that um, was prepared for today, I did together with uh, Lena Cluxton, who is a very a specialist in the very young children, the zero to four year olds. Um, and we really um, have been thrilled to be invited to present this material because what we hope through the material is that it will inspire you to keep doing what you're already doing, to, to do the things that in your heart you know are the right for your children, and also to really respect a very much um, I think the, uh, the, the rhythms that, uh, that you know from your cultural and ancestral teachings that have gotten forgotten when we've moved into this kind of technological age. Um, and so I, I think that um, what you're going to hear today, uh, you already know, um, but it also hopefully will help you to feel more confident in what it is that you're doing for the children that are in your care. If we can take care of these little ones and give them the conditions that they need um, within our centers, um, they will be able to grow and develop uh, and, and do all sorts of amazing, wonderful things. But we need the, the, this early childhood time, as you know, is a very, very precious, precious time. And, um, and so we need to protect it and take care of it. So today, let me just share my screen here. Um, okay, uh, there we go. Let me just get that. So, so today our uh, our session is going to focus on the importance of play, um, and we'll have a, a little bit of a, of a break in the middle, and then we'll look again more at kind of creating the classroom culture for play, and then really looking in more depth at uh, emotional expression and the importance of play in that. So really, we'll, the first part we'll look at is how why play is essential for growth, um, also emotional well-being, and the conditions that we can create in our in our centers in our, in our centers in your settings for that. Um, we have a lovely picture here of uh, my colleague Lena who hopefully will be able to join us um, even if only you'll be able to hear her voice because uh, you can see her here at uh, Bowdoin College Children's Center in in the United States in Maine um, and she has worked for many many years with these very very young children and has really applied and worked into everything that she did with the children a very developmental approach and has seen the effect that it's had on the children um, and is, is helps to, to convince us that we need to follow the pace that children do. Again, we always remember 
the the seasons that there's time in every season things come for a reason you can't rush it you have to wait for it you have to honor it in the way that it is uh, we're moving now from from winter into spring it's still going to be quite a while before spring will come before summer will come but it's all about honoring that time and that and that space um, and uh, she really um, enjoys a, a philosopher called Parker Palmer. So I'll just read very quickly what he has said. I've spent most of my life living in places where the winters can be brutal. So for most of my adult life, I've been reflecting on what it takes to winter through. I'm not looking to them for tips and tricks and techniques for wintering through. It's enough for me to know that uh, these Tiwa speaking brothers and sisters with deep roots in their indigenous religion have done exactly that against greater odds than I will ever face. My work is to find my own roots, roots deep down in my uh, in the ground of my own life, roots that can survive the winter, then emerge, then thrive in the form of new life when the season is right. And I think if we think of ch early childhood as really the time for when we develop those roots, and in past sessions, we've looked at uh, developing the roots of attachment. Um, and we're going to be looking, really looking at, at play and why play is important. And of course, I know that every single one of you are committed to letting children play. This is, you know that this is, this is the, the, the conditions for children. But I think um, we just, we're gonna just kind of give you a, a little bit of a, of a way of looking at things, a way of just sort of thinking about it. And also a little bit about what the, the neuroscience now is telling us. And so first of all, it's, it's a spontaneous activity that cannot be taught or commanded. Um, I know that, uh, that all of you, um, most of your children, if you provide them the space, they will find something to occupy themselves in that space. Um, and the, what they do in that space uh, with young children is called play, whether, you know, it, it can be so many different forms, and we'll see that as we go through the session today. Um, what's really interested, interesting here, and when we get a little bit later in the session, we'll look at it again, is that it's a bounded space in which to move and to operate freely. And what do we mean by, about, by a bounded space? What we mean here is that the space has kind of a circle around it. It has a protective layer around it. And of course, we as the adults who are there for the children, we are providing that protective layer. And within that protective layer, now children can move and explore and do all the things that, uh, that they need to do. Um, we're going to look a little bit later about emotions, but one of the big things about, about play is that it's a place to digest fears without it being overwhelming and scary. And you can see in the picture here, <laughs> a child who is trying something, you know, and again, for children, we, as I say, a very broad definition of play is every interaction, every activity that they are engaged in is part of the play process for them. And this little one is trying to figure out how to get down off this, this little sort of passageway here um, and falls down. But again, the adults are there. The adults are aware whether this would be something that would hurt the child. Uh, they give the child enough space uh, to be able to notice their own reaction about it. Um, this little one fell down and seems a little bit shocked, but not terribly upset. And now something has happened in that process. Oh my goodness, if I fall, I can handle a certain amount of falling. And we all know in life, uh, we need to be able to tolerate and to handle when things don't work for us, when we don't, then things are unexpected. And that's very much what the role of play is, is to allow children that space without it becoming overwhelming. If this child had hurt themselves, if they were upset, clearly you would be there to take care of them. But in that process, we allow them to experience some of these little sort of scary things because that helps them to figure out how their world can work. Uh, Dr. Neufeld likes to show play in a bubble. As I say, we're the bubble. Um, that it is something that is engaging. It's not always fun. 
but it's engaging. It's something that, that helps the child to focus. Um, there's safety in that and there's and in that safe because there's people taking care of them, but there's also freedom. There's, there's a chance to try all different kinds of things out, whatever it is that engages you that you want to do and you don't have to do anything particular. Um, it's not for real, <laughs> we know that. Um, it's, uh, it's something that uh, there's, it, it's, it, if something doesn't work right in play, that's okay. Uh, it's expressive and we'll look at that later on in the session. Um, and it's not work, it's not something that you have to do. And it's, it's it, with our very, very little ones, with our zero to four year olds, we're not usually too worried about them working. Um, but we have to be very careful to just be, be aware that sometimes our own desire to um, uh, to kind of move things along or to do our job, uh, sometimes we want to uh, see a result. Um, and we have to make the difference between what actual play is and what work is. Um, the focus on play is the actual activity itself. Um, it's not whether or not you're able to do it successfully. So the, the actual activity is the focus of play. Um, whatever engages, is is part of play. Uh, so, in other words, it's not that it's not that what you're engaged in is going to produce a project, uh, an outcome, but it can produce an outcome. For example, children, many children as they get a little bit older, like to do puzzles, um, and so it it engages them. They they like it and they like it when the puzzle is done. But it isn't getting the puzzle done that's the purpose. It's the actual engagement in the activity. Is it something enjoyable while you're doing? And it doesn't matter if you get it done. And of course, that is where the fun or the engagement is. It's in the actual activity itself and not whether or not you, you have accomplished it. Um, we have some quotes here from different people. Kay Redfield Jameson. Uh, showed, just yes. so you know, Eva, I am ah, here. Oh, wonderful. Oh, excellent. So we're just looking so at the... Clicking along, so I don't know where we are or what's been said, uh, and I apologize. Seems no problem. Well, welcome, Lena. <laughs> um, so I will orient you. I'm just, just, just finishing uh, the slide on play versus work. And so um, I'm, and I was just going to read the uh, the okay. quote from Kay Redfield Jameson, and then I'll orient you to the slides. I know you have them in front of you, so I'll tell you which I'm one I'm at. at them now. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I'm so, looking at them now, and um, at, at some point, I'd like to chime in uh, with where we are. So yeah. thank you, Eva. Yeah. Good, good. Uh, children need the freedom and the time to play. Play is not a luxury. Play is a necessity. And so what do they need from us in order to play? Freedom from the work motif. Um, this is something that... Um, working, making ourselves do something that we don't like to do, because that's also one of the other definitions of work, um, really can't be done until the child is six to seven years old, where they have that part of their brain called the prefrontal cortex that can get them to do that. And so we need to be very, very careful here, not to get children to work for things like rewards or to achieve a goal or even to avoid unpleasant consequences. Uh, really, uh, the, that, that whole engagement in that takes away from all of the other things that they should putting their, be putting their time and energy into. Lena, I don't know if you want yeah. to add something. So, well, I, I just want to maybe begin, and, and I know you probably have said this already, but as I was preparing for this um, presentation, I was immersing myself in, in the play paradigm again. And I thought this is actually, um, if one uh, figures out that play is really the foundation of emotional health and that the time of life most devoted to play, and play is a funny word actually, is early childhood, then we would make this a core piece, a foundational piece of our curriculum. And that there are certain principles, again, I may be repeating what Eva has said, or I may be jumping ahead, and I apologize for that. But there are certain principles that are foundational to this, which you see on these slides, that it's engaging. 
and um, that uh, the one we just went back, I'm just going back for a minute, that it feels safe. And this word freedom keeps coming up in these slides over and over and over again. So I've been thinking, um, what is it that play is about? It needs to come out. It comes out, and this is an interesting thought for everybody, out of boredom often. It is what engages when there is nothing else to engage in. And so we need to embrace this idea and make room for this activity, which is called play, which has nothing around it except our loving presence. Um, and it, it's a place of digestion. You know, we think of the young child as somebody who needs to eat a lot, and then they need a lot of rest from eating um, and from activity. One of the purposes of play is that this is a place where we can digest and put down those roots that we're talking about and reconnect to our developmental nature, which is so tied to the natural world. We need time to digest what has happened to us. This need doesn't go away with adulthood. This need is always there for engagement that has no outcome. So if we think, okay, this is really important for young children, how do we then, and we're going to get to this in this presentation, how do we then prepare ourselves, our room, the children for this important, important um, aspect of development to take place. Because of all things we do for young children, and attachment and so on, what we're really working for, where we want to go, is into play. That's why we're doing this. So, um, Yes, it, it should not be uh, something that is outcome-based. And there's so many, and again, we'll talk about this, there's so many little things that our adult role demands of us in order to build this bubble, this gorgeous bubble in which play can take place. And if you think of play as a digestion of experience, among all the other things it is, which we will touch on, then um, you you know get, getting comfortable with with giving that some space and creating that bubble and not <laughs> not really being too worried if children are bored because uh, it's out of this that they begin to play sometimes yeah. some children just play but sometimes yeah. it takes this moment of not having anything else to do yeah that brings that up this inner experience yeah it, and i think right. again so that's why I covered all of this um, no no nope, uh, nope. uh, no nope, that was a yeah. perfect 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 segue right into what it is that uh yeah because I, I think I again when we think about play is that like we have the picture of the little one there wiping the counter and the little one will wipe the counter as long as it's interesting and engaging to wipe that counter but it doesn't matter whether the little one gets the counter clean or not and might stop halfway in between and all of a sudden need to digest what it is that happened. Um, so I, I think, yes, I think that that giving that space for it to to to, to um, unfold in whatever way it, it works for that particular child. Yes, yeah, just like their digestion would unfold. And this is this is actually a, a changing table. Um, we had the need for two in our <laughs> room. So we created one. We kept them scrupulously clean. But he saw us uh, cleaning the changing table after every change. So there he is working away at it himself. Yeah. But it engages him. And, uh, yeah. and yeah, there it is. And it's imitative. Yeah, it's yeah. imitative, which, as we know, is, is one of the roots of, of attachment, is that sameness. Uh, which manifests itself in imitation. Yes, and in our next slide here, where we're saying that we should be injecting fun into the activities we like them to engage in. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that one there, Lena? Yeah. They're cleaning the stools. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I had 
even I had a nice discussion about about this and why this one would be included, why I would choose this particular slide. And uh, because it looks like work, right? They are cleaning things. Um, and But we don't really care about an outcome. Um, we want them to engage in the care of the room. The stools that they sit on to eat and the tables that they eat on do get dirty. They do need cleaning. And it's something when we start doing it as the adults in the room, they eagerly participate in. But we don't have any expectation that they will, that the stools at the end of the day are going to be uh, finished, you know, to our standards. So we would just quietly uh, make sure. But there they are, fully engaged in the care of the room. And you can just see with the little girl on the right how deeply engrossed she is in doing this activity. So it looks like work, but it's play because we've made it fun. We've yeah. just, we haven't demanded anything and we're just doing it to, all together. And if they don't actually want to do it or want to do something a bit, to. they don't need to. Yes, yes. And that's, I think, again. Um, Invitational. And that's the thing with play is that it can't, I think this was probably already said, I don't know, because I don't have the order of the slides memorized, but it cannot be commanded. So um, always invitational. Yeah. And when it is engaged invitationally, um, it, it, it is what it is. It is the play like it, it. I think this is one of the things that we want to sort of emphasize today is that it isn't just, you know, playing with dolls or playing with cars. It is engaging in the world in a particular kind of way, which is you know, expressive and, and allows the child to choose to do it, but it can look very purposeful, but the, it, the activity is what's important, not the outcome. And that's why we need on the next slide here, um, we need to make sure that there's enough freedom from screens and stimulation. And I, I'm, I know that most of you probably don't have that, but it's very tempting to, to in this day and age for us to put something into the hands of children so they won't be bored, but actually boredom is what leads them to find something else to do. Um, we shouldn't have too many structured activities. Um, we shouldn't have um, very much instruction, formal instruction time at all, because what we want, and I just love these two pictures, we've got one here and the next one. Uh, here's a little guy, and again, Lena, tell us a little bit about <laughs> what's going on here this little fellow yeah yes so um what we're seeing here is that actually there's another point that i think is really important to make which is um well there's two points one is that uh, you don't need toys for you just need objects is what some people call them um, and so this object that this child is in is um, actually, I think it was supposed to be a bookcase. But anyway, we never used it as one um, because at this age, books just got torn up or eaten. So we kept them in a special place where we were in more charge of them. But um, there he is. And the other piece that I want to point out in this is the archetypal nature of play. And by archetype, I mean there are certain motifs that happen in play over and over and over again. And getting into little boxes. I have dozens of pictures, I'm sure you do too, of children building forts, getting into boxes, finding a little corner. So that's what he is doing. And we can see him, obviously, but that matters not. And then in this one, um, there he is just... Oh, you could just feel how filled up he is with what his activity has been. He's just, I can almost feel that big out breath happening of satisfaction that he has um, created a, a space for himself and whatever is going on with him. Here he is in a, play, in a place of expression of satisfaction, I would say, with yeah. what he has done. Yep. Yep, and then probably ready to move on to something else. But this has been his job, his play for now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and that deep emotional satisfaction that we've all experienced 
from when we are so deeply engaged in something that we get into what psychologists would call a flow space, yeah. flow experience, that here, that's what we're looking for, is flow. And, and this comes about through the freedom that we create in making an environment that is conducive to play. So freedom is such an important word here. Yeah. And here it is again. We see a child using boards. And, and so it's, it is the curriculum of, of, of early childhood. Um, we don't need to add a whole lot more in because children will do, and we're going to see shortly how it affects other, so many aspects of their development. I don't know if you want so to add. See, yes, and, yes, and, and in fact, um, here's the statement. Um, play, not instruction, should be the core curriculum of all early childhood education. And we know from our past sessions, the reason for this is the brain developing. And that will be talked about a little bit, uh, well, a bit more, because it's so important that this is what the brain is meant to do at this age. This uh, prepares them to receive instruction. And this prepares a child when we allow this freedom of play to put their attention where their heart is at the moment, where their interest is. And this capacity of building attention and building um, creative problem solving and having this freedom to play prepares them for school. This is what prepares them for school. As long as there has been enough literacy around them, enough engagement, enough attachment, everything is moving as it should, actually allowing space for play is preparation for schooling. I love this David Hockney quote down at the bottom of this. Um, people tend to forget that play is serious. Um, David Hockney was an important 20th century artist. I think he was from the UK. Anyway, he said this. He probably played a lot because his paintings are playful. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Yes, and um, Diane Ackerman as well. Play is our brain's way of learning. Yes, yes. So um, learning, of course, does happen in the brain, but sometimes we don't really give enough space to the fact that children doing these simple things that we take for granted, that this is a huge learning yeah. moment. Yeah, yeah. Getting sand and... in a bucket. <laughs> so many things right so many little things and and if the child is engaged with it that is what they need to be doing at that moment in time for them for themselves yeah 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 so uh, give space for experiences to grow the brain through engagement <laughs> again we have a whole mm -hmm. number of quite a few little guys here finding just finding yeah. fascination Yes, and um, nobody worried about how wet they're going to get or, and of course, keeping an eye out for the fact that there's standing water. This is the spring melt at the uh, Bowdoin playground. There they are. They've created a boat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And of course, we know that uh, the most impressive brain growth happens when play is in the context of warm human connection. Yes, and there's, there's connection there, not through my helping him or being worried for him or anything, but just in taking delight in what he's doing, climbing up and sliding down. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So playful so acts. They have this feeling. Oh, I just go ahead. Go ahead. This is, such important, this is such an important point, Eva. I know you you're you're giving me pause here. Um, that what we're doing when we fill the child up emotionally with our warm human connection is a, then they have what they need to venture forth into play. So again, just to emphasize that we can fill them up. We don't have to play with. Um, we don't have to be engaged in their play because that 
automatically shifts it from them to we take a, a, a role and it changes it. And we'll talk more about that later. But that they can venture forth on their own knowing that there's um, a person there who is present for them. Yeah. And we can do this at times of bodily care. We fill them up. We've said this before. Uh, there's many opportunities during the day to fill a child up with um, emotional stability and attachment so that they can venture forth into play. Yeah. And the brain development. This is something that uh, is, uh, for me, very, very fascinating. And I have to admit that um, when I finally, finally understood it, um, I, it then made it very, very clear for me that how important um, play all the way through, even past our kindergarten, even into our grade one, obviously even later on um, as we develop, but certainly in those early, early years. Um, and it is that playful activity that makes the positive difference in the brain development. And I'm going to take a little moment here to tell you a little bit about the brain. Um, we have, as you know, many parts to our brain. And uh, they're, uh, they have started now in the last 20 years or so to be able to study a, 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 a brain that's alive, a brain that is functioning, and they watch. They're able to, to watch what is happening as a human being engages in different kinds of activities. Um, and there is one part of our brain um, that we didn't actually respect very much um, because we, we didn't understand its role. But um, a wonderful man called Ian McGilchrist uh, did a full study about the, the two main parts of our brain and realize that the part of our brain that we thought was more uh, oriented towards art and and uh, creativity and space, um, which which we thought was lovely, but we really you know, value sort of the part of our brain that is more logical and has a lot of facts and can, you know, can kind of, you know, state things and how they are. And when he started to look at all of the wonderful research on the brain, what he realized was that if the part of our brain that can't that that needs to see the whole picture, if the part of our brain that makes the connections between things in a nonverbal way, not just with words, but with visions, with pictures, with ideas, that if that part of the brain is not fully and well developed, that we won't be able to make sense about the things that we learn from our environment. And the research is now showing us that the part of our brain that makes sense of the world is the part of the brain that is rapidly developing in these early years. And there is no way to get that part of the brain to develop except by giving experiences. It's only, you can't tell that part of the brain anything. That part of the brain to develop has to actually engage in the process, which is what play is all about. Now, that doesn't mean to say we can't put specific pieces of information or details in. But remember, when the part of the brain that is learning a detail from somebody else is engaged, the part of the brain that is making sense of the world has to go on hold. And again, there's nothing wrong with giving children information, teaching them how to pronounce a word, you know, giving them certain kinds of facts. That's, that's wonderful. And many children love to have facts and learn facts. But the part of the brain that needs the time and space is this part that actually makes sense of things. I don't know, Lena, if you want to add anything to that or did I cover it? So what you might wonder, what you might wonder here, Eva, is what, what the heck is going on that, um, it, that is, is working with the brain. So if you just listed what you see in this picture, because it's all about what we see. So there's, there's a sense of participation. There's a sense of balance. I'm singing Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall, and I put a beanbag on my head. There's the wall with my hands. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. I lean my fo head forward, and the beanbag falls on the floor. They can repeat this game a million times, and they never get tired of it because repetition is also key to how children play at this age. But the 
what they're learning is language. Um, there's because it's a rhyme. There's a song. There we're participating together. We're having fun, and they're learning how to balance something on their head, which can come in handy in life, right? I mean, balance is one of one of our main senses in a way. So um, I just wanted to explain why this picture actually reveals a lot about play and and uh, and the adult role in it, which is to just show that little activity and then let it go. Yeah, and I think that's that's I'm that done. lovely yeah. dance that we that we have with this with with our interaction with children in a playful mode, is that. It, we allow them to take from it what they wish to take from it, right? And each child will will it will be mean something different to each child, um, but the engagement in a playful, fun way is it, so we have a role as adults uh, in it. But it's a it's a, a, a giving the space or giving an experience and not worrying about the outcome, which I think is important here. Yeah. Then we have our. Of course, our problem solvers here. Yeah, we have a little guy who's. Yeah. Yeah. And this is, as you say, even this, you know, this problem solving aspect of play is just a hugely important one. Now, I want to say something about this slide as well, which is he is completely engaged in something that's quite tricky, and we know that's going to fall down. But he has his own frustration level. Here he is learning to, learning to manage frustration on his own without being told because he gets to decide when he's had enough. And we know that what can happen when they've had enough is the blocks go flying across the room or whatever. He has a little bag to put them in there. But they, when, when it becomes too frustrating, they stop. They know. But in the meantime, here he is dealing with it, falling down, putting it back, falling down, putting it back, and learning to deal with frustration emotionally on his own time, as well as solving the problem of um, how to get things to balance. And you'll see where he goes with this in the next slide. Yes. Amazing. Yeah. 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 At focus and some things fell down there's other things that went up instead it's not quite as tall but look at that huge yeah. structure that's so beautifully made yeah and it would be so we tempting to want to give him to want it to want to give him a tip about how to make it do this or do that but unless he's looking to us for that tip we really need to let it be in his hands right in terms of how yes, he exactly. he will solve yes. it, and if he gets frustrated, we also yes. again need to truly understand. Remember that dealing with things that don't work is all part of the human experience, and so this exactly. allows him to figure out how much he can handle and how far he can go. And when he's had enough, then we that's it. <laughs> that yeah, and we don't have to fix it for him, but rather provide some comfort in the fact that it didn't work, should it come to that. Yeah. Um, we'll be talking about that next time, that this whole, this whole uh, needing to, to um, just be with the emotion and not, not always fix it. Yeah, and here's another... Should another get to that point, yeah. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. And here's another, another set of problem solving. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing to me when I see these pictures, Lena, they're so beautiful and they just display so clearly um, what it is that we're trying to say here. This, this, little, this little one has figured yeah. something out. I think they're doing she's, it on their own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. And so this is it. Give as much space for that. And of course, again, we'll talk a little bit later, but outdoors it's very helpful sometimes to be able to do it in a in a larger space yeah and the, the again one of the archetypal themes that is the repetitive themes that we see in play is the over and over and over again aspect you can be sure that this happened multiple times she's up she's down she's up she's down and we all see this in children but that's how their their brains work yeah and their yeah. emotions yeah well, and again, because of course, the brain is basically building itself, right? It's making those connections. And it is through the repetition that the connections can happen. And so we need to allow, again, hold space for this child to do what 
they need to do at that moment in time. And then when they've had enough to know that that's as much as they can handle at that time. This is this is one that I, I just love as well, is this they the play is they discover their personal interests and preferences um, and uh, uh, to find and express their true selves, who they are, what they like as the tender new self grows. Yeah. Yes, and and here we have just a whiteboard outside on top of a table of some sort and sand, and this child is making art, finding out how his arm works, how you know something pokes through when you. It, this is all new information that the white comes through when you move the sand. That your fingers make these these um, marks. It's really uh, quite extraordinary. And I remember when I first heard Dr. Neufeld say that part of the reason for, uh, part of what a, a young child is doing um, is finding out who they are and what they like at this age and how important this is for them to know who they are and what they like as an adult. Just, it struck me. I had to go back, actually, and listen to it two or three times to fully take in that that's what a lot of this was about, figuring out who I am. Um, and you probably have seen this in your classrooms, but a child will be identified with a certain toy. In my classroom, a little boy was identified with a pair of mittens. They were blue and white stripes. And people just let him have those mittens. There wasn't any question about those were his mittens. Of course, they weren't, but it was acknowledged that his preference was for that color. Um, and he loved those mittens. And it was the same with the dolls. There were certain rose baby and green baby and blue baby it had children who particularly wanted them. And we always tried to respect that. Yeah, and they'll they they'll try out different things and play with different objects, and some they will really love to play with, and other ones isn't for them, and that's all part of that process of what are my preferences, what do I like, um, and so very very important to have a lot of time to explore that as well. Yeah. And then of course, what we are often encouraged to to have children do is to play with each other. Um, and it is, it is important. Um, we know in the early, early days, of course, um, probably well, even close to four years old, um, it is really more about playing beside someone else, uh, but it's also engaging somewhat with them as well. Yes. And truly, we, we are worried about inclusion in our world. And this is not just something that we're worried about in childhood. But in, in our world, we, we are looking for ways to um, have a sense of community that's broader and more diverse than, than perhaps um, we are living in right now. And thinking that children uh, need to learn to be inclusive um, is part of, of what we hold as a goal. And I'm just maintaining that inclusion really happens when children have moments of play together when the differences between them kind of go away in a magic moment of, of play. They may not end up being best friends with somebody that they had purposefully excluded from their play before, but it certainly can help um, neighborhoods where children are, are exposed to a lot of different ages and a lot of different children are such a wonderful thing and somewhat of the past, at least in, in um, uh, the U.S., where everything is a play date and so on. So you've picked the child that you're going to play with rather than having to accommodate to many children. Yeah. Um, and I think this, this is in a really an important part of learning to be inclusive. It happens on an emotional level, not on a, a forced, you know, be inclusive yeah. sort of. Yeah. And children like, they like to be with each other. So it's, it's, they will, they will gravitate, I think, to being with each other and gravitate to doing things together, fosters belonging and encourages cooperation. <laughs> what are these little ones here are 
trying to pull a little guy with a sled? <laughs> yes, right. And they work together. That's something we would see in the inside play, but more importantly in the outside play, particularly in the winter, the sleds. Um, and we teachers didn't pull them, but the children, except for the very tiny ones, but the children made their own caravans, they made their own way, and they helped each other with sleds. So this child is going to get to go down that snow hill, which is covered with sand, um, their idea, uh, because of the efforts of her classmates. Yeah, yeah. And of course, knowing that, again, their ability to, you know, to cooperate for long periods of time together might not be quite that that wonderful. So we are, uh, you know, we're sensitive to the fact that uh, when they've had it, they've had it. But uh, when they're engaged in it, it is very much what they want to do. Um, and again, they're learning about what that means, but they're not yet ready to completely do it as as effectively as an older child as an older child would. Oh, it's for emotional expression and they need the freedom and the time to play. It's a luxury, not a necessity. Once again, saying that. And I think again, we've got here, uh, um, you were saying, uh, Lena, that there are certain themes that come back that just seem to satisfy yes. some kind of an emotional need, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, indeed. And you probably have seen this in your classrooms, but children around the age of two, tend to take everything in the room and pile it into a pile. And this seems to be one of those universal themes that's satisfying some emotional need. And then yeah. the, the pickup of it becomes a playful activity as well. But we, we made room for, for them to express this, whatever it was. And <laughs> literally, the shelves would be bare and everything would be piled in a pile. They would pile things in the pile. Well, from a psychologist's point of view, I think there's a little part of me that thinks, you know, you don't have much, as a little child, you don't have much control over your world. There's not a lot that, you know, that you can kind of um, fix in terms, but this is something you can do, right? You can, you can organize those baskets in a way that satisfies you. Uh, <laughs> And uh, in its a way, uh, it's, it's an yeah, emotional like expression. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, we have just the, the regular, and we'll talk again towards the end. Uh, we, um, we've invited Sarah to, to share with us her experience as an artist about all the ways in which play can really give space for the multiple, multiple kinds of emotions that we have as human beings. So just a little, a little review or a summary here is that it has many, many purposes. Um, if children are basically playing for most of the day, as much of the day as we can give them space for, some amazing, amazing things are happening. It's building the brain, it's exploration and problem solving, it's uh, discovering who, we, who they are in terms of their a personal interests and preferences. It, it creates the basis for companionship and playing with others. Um, it allows for emotional expression. And um, children, of course, have the talent to play. But as Ralph Waldo Emerson says, it's a happy talent to know how to play. And this is, of course, something that we also as adults need to, to continue to do. So it's a very, very, very critical piece. And uh, it is, uh, I know, in, uh, sometimes when you look up the definition of play, one of the saddest things is that it is a purposeless activity. It could not be more purposeful. It has so, so, so many mm -hmm. reasons. Yeah. Yes, indeed. It is, in, in when we start looking at it as purposeful, um, our eyes change, our way of seeing changes. Yeah. It's the most purposeful um, activity of early childhood. Yes. For yeah. all those reasons, yeah. Um, so, of course, um, we, we always... Sorry? To talk about, yes, play and attachment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm just going to mute my microphone because I have to cough here. So I will let you uh, talk about that. Oh, Okay. <laughs> So play, um, of course, because we're an attachment-based um, uh, people, um, we will bring this back to how attachment plays a role in, in play. And we know that um, the 
brain works best and they venture forth best when they are in a place where they feel safe from the worry of who is taking care of me. So this is just repeated here in this slide. Attachment always takes priority over play and must be satisfied for them to feel emotionally filled up and safe enough to venture forth. And so, of and, course, um, it's about uh, our... Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Well, it's about that invitation, right? And uh, again, just to fill that, fill it up. And I think, again, one of the things that I've really come to appreciate, Lena, from, from what you've shared with us is that those those activities that uh, you know, like the changing of the diaper, can be a wonderful attachment based activity, a place to fill the child up. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yes, they're the best place, and this comes from the work of Emmy Pickler, who ran a, an orphanage in Budapest after World War II, and she had not enough staff, um, of course, so she quickly figured out that these were the opportunities to build a relationship were right there with the bodily care. So they were very attentive, very detailed or oriented, and very present with the child in, in those times of bodily care. So, yeah. Um, and no, yeah. This, which picture are we on now? We're the one with the, the um, there's a, a you're one of, I don't remember what her name is, but she's holding a little baby and going to get the diaper and and looks like carrying the baby oh, over okay so did we did we talk about the one before the invitation to exist uh that's the one Inv yeah yeah warm invitation to exist oh we removed that one got it that yes. didn't get removed on my copy sorry yeah. Yeah, yes yeah. exactly yeah all right perfect and there's no more to be said but that's that is it we, yeah. we would walk a baby through the entire process of a diaper change but for me, like, like what, what that has shifted for me is that the act of changing the diaper and recreate and, and using that moment for a deep connection with the child then prepares the child for the most important thing that they're going to do next, which is to continue to play, right? And which is our next slide, <laughs> that one is free to play only when the proximity to the caring alpha is secure enough to take for granted. And so it's, it's so interesting because the most important act we can do is to get the child ready to be able to be open to play. Do I get it right there? Is <laughs> That's right. That's right. That is our task, is to, is to create the conditions and get the child ready to play. And um, I love this picture. Even I talked about it because, again, there are really no toys involved. There's a stump. And we love um, natural objects for children to play with because tactile, their, their sense of touch and is so important at this age. And here they're touching something that has texture. Oftentimes, many of the toys that we see today that are plastic, but there is no difference in the tactile experience of the child. So this is, this is nice that we can just take stumps and then she has a um, sheepskin there that she's playing with. Again, imagine the sensory um, experience of, of that for her. Yeah, the one side, the other side, having different feelings, um, a little bit fluffy and then something smoother on the other side where the skin is. Um, you were saying also that just the, the stump, there's the roughness, the... the um, uh, what do they call it? The uh, <laughs> the, bark. Um, the bark. Sorry, the bark. Yes, and that the children like yeah. to play with the bark as well. Um, yeah, yeah. And Many then part of the care of the classroom was also we would um, use a uh, dog brush to clean the sheepskins. We use mm -hmm. sheepskins because that's what is around in Maine. Um, and they so cleaning them laundering them outside in a tub. I mean, th these are the kinds of activities that are so wonderful to do with children in a playful way, but they're also taking care of everything that we have. Yeah. yeah. So every one of those interactions are playful interactions in that broader sense uh, for these children. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're getting close to our break, so I'm going to, uh, to stop sharing here and uh, invite Cheryl to come and just share some of her thoughts with us.
Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Takes me time to press that mic button. <laughs> um, you know, just thinking about what, what you guys are saying about, you know, like connection, like cultivating connections, you know. I think this is really, you know, we we have, um, you know, in nurturing and attachment, we need to show that we're present, you know, that we're always available on here. And this, you know, it's kind of like the circle of attachment where the child doesn't go too far and, unless they feel very, very comfortable. So I think that they need that, that groundedness. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and as well, you know, the observation, you know, like, I see you, I see what you're doing, you know, I acknowledge you. And this is like, I would say one of the cultivating connections that should be, uh, you know, instilled, as well as their curiosity, you know, like, uh, I'm wondering about you and what you're doing. I'm curious, what are you going to do next to show that you're, you're supportive and that you're interested in what, what they're playing with or what they're doing yeah. and empathy when they don't uh, you know like that they they feel something they get hurt by something but you're there to recognize that and you're there to put words to that oh you know you pinch your finger on that ow that must have hurt yeah. I don't think you know where if, if it's younger like a child who's younger bobo oh no you got a bobo <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah and all of those interactions then make the child feel cared for don't they yeah. yes and you know encouragement to to keep on going because sometimes a child is not sure and they look up at you you know and they're like i'm not sure if i should go on with this but that reassuring glance to say you can do this you know i'm here i support you yeah and i guess you know in the end you know like the when you reflect upon it all like what has the child gained you know in terms of an early childhood educator i looked at it myself and said you know like reflect back on what they were doing you know like how um, they've developed to come this far and if they haven't come to the the milestone that should have been reached why so I love, you know, there's a lot of observation involved in there. And I feel that, you know, the, the importance of cultivating a connection is, is extremely important in this stage. Yeah. Well, within that connection, the, the, you know, as humans, we're why we have, how should I put it? They, it, they've now actually studied. Um, I mean, again, it's really hard for, for me to know how they've been able to do this. But one of the things that they, they say the impulse to play is one of the three big impulses that we have as human beings. We have the impulse to love, we have the impulse to play, and we have the impulse to achieve, to get things done. And I don't know how they've been able to kind of figure that out, but they actually see parts of the brain that are activated and play is an impulse. And it is through play that the brain will go, grow and develop. But what allows that impulse to manifest itself is the child has to feel safe right mm -hmm. like yeah and so so we need to make them feel safe and you know you were saying about perhaps a child not reaching a milestone and of course that is a concern but i, I know that you also look for improvement right mm -hmm. where did the child start and how far did they come and exactly. then trusting that if they've been given you know that we, we're going to keep creating the best environment so that their brain can do its job which it's wired to do but again it's of course there's many many factors in there and we will look in some of the next sections we'll look at why it is harder for some children's brains to have the luxury of developing the, the way that they should right because it's uh but it's all it's all in there yeah and you know when uh, lena said you know freedom comes out of boredom you know curiosity is born and you know when when i look at play you know like uh you know like it didn't seem like play but you know we were born with you know there's a purpose for everything and what we did you know like as kids they're not the things that a normal child you know in daycare would be doing today they're, they had we had no daycare back then <laughs> 
yeah. so, you know like we were you know in the Tokenogan with our parents and brought in the bush and we had to go hunting with our families and you know in my case that's what it was you know like you know we had to get fish and, yeah. and it was even more you know like uh, it happened more in my grandparents days you know in my father's days because you know like they had a role to play and I'm saying a role to play. <laughs> yeah. but, it, but I guess, but Cheryl, do you think so? Yeah, I mean, but do you, but I mean, I, I would suspect that, um, again, there were things that had to be done for the basic survival of the family. But within that, I'm sure that at each age, ch a child was only given as much as they could handle. Yes, but you know what, to me, like, when you go fishing and you get to clean a fish and you get to take out all this guts and you do all this stuff, that was play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. And you know, Cheryl, I just want to piggyback on something that you're saying, uh, if I may. Is, sure. is this a good time? Yes. Um, which is that, you know, we're talking about the role of the adult. And it's, it's so interesting to know that when an adult is engaged in something that doesn't take their presence away from the child, which we've mentioned and you've mentioned, Cheryl, several times, I'm here mm -hmm. for you, like cleaning a fish, for instance, it's extremely um, engaging for a child when they see an adult engaged. So when one is engaged with what one is doing, the child automatically, that's part of the role of the adult in giving them an example of attention focused, and yet they're not being ignored, right? It's a, attention to something that they can imitate, that they can see, that they understand. It's quite different than um, being on a phone or where your attention is really taken away or a computer versus ironing clothes, washing dishes, something like this that makes more sense to their primitive brain. Um, so our engagement as adults in meaningful work is really part of the template of set, setting the stage for play for a child. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, But I, I'm sure that, yeah. again, it, it's that the child participates in the activity but if they can't get it right we're not going to be upset with them right like I think that's that's that oh, no, fine no, little no. nuance there is that they will you know they will children can work really hard but it's because they they're engaged in it it's not because they have to we unfortunately do things because we have to <laughs> no, but what I'm saying is Sometimes they gave you a responsibility would... that it didn't seem like play like uh, I took the fish and you know when they they took out the guts and stuff, used it as a fertilizer. And here we are, you know, playing sand, uh, soil in the garden. Yeah. And we're mixing, yeah. fertilizing yeah. fish guts with, with the garden soil. And, you know, like as, as the garden grows throughout the summer, you get these beautiful orange carrots. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So so that's, that's exactly the right example. And when a child is really little, for instance, when I was doing, I didn't gut fish, sadly, with them, but I, I did um, do flower arranging and planting, but I'd give them their, their when they were too little to imitate in, in any way that would not be uh, frustrating, that I would give them their own little flowers in a little vase. To, and so whatever they did, it didn't matter, but they got to play with that, or I'd give them something to plant that, again, didn't it didn't matter it was theirs to do with as they wished well i was doing the other work near them is that yeah I, I can't really tell if i'm on track here yeah i you know i i guess part of the message and we need to take a break in a very a very quick moment but uh, you know i think one of the most interesting things is that it is about our our presence in the relationship with children and if, if we delight in what they do and give them the space to do what they can do, that is part of their play. Um, it's very different than, if, you know, than, than making them have to do something. And there are things they have to do, but you know, giving space. But luckily, as you say, Cheryl, we have the opportunity now to, to have safe places where the children can come, where the adults have work, you know, have, that their job is to, to watch for them. And so, uh, you know, it, it, at least especially for parents that feel quite stressed, um, there is a lovely place where this freedom 
its freedom to experience themselves is prov provided. And uh, this is what the purpose of today's session is to encourage um, all of you to, you know, to keep doing that. And we're going to, we'll, we'll continue after the break because we have a few more things we want to add. Great. So let's take a 15 minutes and we'll come back at quarter to uh, quarter to three. I will continue here, although this is very much um, very much uh, what Lena herself was doing in the classroom, as you can tell, for those of you that haven't heard Lena speak before, and I'm sorry you can't see her, but um, that she, uh, her experience. Here, by the way. Oh, good. Yay. <laughs> Perfect timing. <laughs> good. good. I was just, just going to sing your praises here, dear. <laughs> Oh, well, all right. Go ahead. <laughs> no, just kidding. Well, I was just saying to people, as they could tell, that uh, that you bring a wealth of experience and, and the day-to-day -day work of, of interacting with children and knowing uh, and finding out what they what they where they flourish the best. And of course, that's what we're looking at right now is just looking at that classroom culture and just again figuring yeah. out what we can do. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and um, just when I started at Bowdoin um, in the child care center, it was not a play-based, attachment-based center. So what we did over the course of eight years was implement what we knew about play and um, the Neufeld paradigm. So this is a very a long process and a slow process and one of tremendous learning. But I do, I do think that... Uh, you can see um, how far we came. Yeah. Yeah, so there there you are creating that safe container. And I think, again, the picture that, that uh, we've, you chose here for us, uh, first of all, the children are in their best way that they can for, I don't know how old they are there, maybe looks like uh, toddlers, two-ish. They're maybe. two, two and a half. They're two. in the young toddler room. Yep. Right. And there they are cooperating, collaborating together to try to get again another sled <laughs> moving along um, as best they can. And, uh, and yes, and they, it was interesting in this particular moment, um, it didn't work when the boy who is currently in the cart, wheelless cart, sled, I guess, um, was pulling it. It didn't work. So they rearranged themselves. So somebody else was pulling, somebody began to push, and he took the ride. So there was a level of cooperation there that was quite lovely to see. To solve a problem. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But we all know that, again, this is something quite fragile yet. Um, it's something that builds very slowly. And, and you know, when, when we think of the brain building itself, we're thinking really, you know, from birth right through to five years old, when there's that big shift to having the, the prefrontal cortex connect. So that's five full years of the brain fix, you know, figuring out how all the connections work and making those connections. And then, of course, there's another 20 years of all those connections becoming stronger and more, more sophisticated. But it's just beautiful to see how the, the, the early seeds of that are here and we honor it and respect it yeah. yeah and the daily rhythms yes you know um this not be spoken about enough that there's a repetition motif that runs through early childhood and they are trying to make sense of the world. And so the day and the season, the day, the month, the seasons, these all are very key to building that bubble of safety. If a child knows what to expect, what's coming, that things are rhythmical, they come in, there's a certain number of things that are offered to them upon arrival, and then at a certain time, there's maybe a snack or a circle. You know you know what your day looks like. But they begin to get the idea that they can count on these things. And then some of the time is going to be that void time where nothing is demanded of them, like it's not time to eat or come to circle, whatever the things are that they have to participate in. There are a few activities offered we offered baking, coloring, um, cutting up vegetables for snack or fruit or something. 
the laundry folding. There were a number of things that were offered in that beginning time, but also there was room for play. So they were free to do which whatever appealed to them. Sometimes they need the structured activity. Sometimes they are ready to play. But having those daily rhythms in place provides the bones of the structure, the skeleton from which they can grow, and, and they know then what is happening. And I, of course, really believe that music reaches a different level of the brain and becomes the best vehicle for marking the transitions or even the activity. For instance, in this boot activity, we always cleaned our boots and shoes off before coming into the classroom. Not quite this much, but we brushed them normally. These were very dirty. But we had a song that went with that. And, um, and that just automatically lifts the mood into something somewhat playful. And certainly, when we know we're going to come in, we start with a song. Um, and then they get the idea that, oh, yeah, it's time to come in, and they follow along. Uh, so I can't say enough about using songs for transitions. And they don't have to be special songs. They can just be songs you already know, just change the words, you know? It's, I, I use the same tune um, with different words constantly, and <laughs> that works very well. Yeah. Here we have uh, a child joining you in a care of the room activity. Yeah, we're sweeping the cubby area. And again, no expectation that he's going to do anything particularly productive. And, <laughs> yeah. and then for the boot cleaning, Actually, um, they were pretty good at getting the mud off their boots. That was a lot of fun and not too hard. <laughs> yeah. And here you're folding, folding laundry. Is that uh, Yes, and that the was next... another, another activity that developed um, starting in the infant room when they would take the laundry. I may have spoken about this before. So they, it, the laundry would be spread all over the room, but I would keep singing my song. Um, and then... Um, I would notice that there was a piece here or there, and they would fetch it. And by the end of the time, everything was back where it needed to be in an orderly way. And um, here you can see the beginnings of he's actually going to participate in folding. And indeed, by the older toddler room, they were very interested in learning how to fold the bib or how to, how to manage these, these foldings. And we, we had a little method, again, accompanied by music. And they were actually folding the laundry. Not all of them were interested, but he was one of the ones that was yeah. interested for three years. Yeah. <laughs> but see there, finding, finding their tender young self, someone who likes to do those kinds of things, right? And if they're engaged, mm, yeah. yeah, I mean, we don't know where that will lead him in terms of perhaps a, a future career, but uh, there are little inklings there of, of a kind of bent that this child has, a, a thing that they enjoy doing, something that feels satisfying to their soul, even though it, you know, it, it can, you know, develop into many interesting kinds of, of things, but they're, they have a chance to try or out just, different things. Yeah. Or just that he knows how to put <laughs> the laundry away, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, let's face it, this is a huge accomplishment yes. in life and something that we struggle with. At least I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, the bodily care and uh, <laughs> this little girl needs her hands washed, I think, at some point. <laughs> right. So form and predictability, um, that's the rhythm that we're trying to, to establish. And just like any piece of music, rhythm can become tedious if it's not broken up here and there. But I would suggest that the breaking up of rhythm is very consciously done and only as the children get a little bit older. Um, in the infant room in particular, we didn't vary from our rhythm very much. There was just uh, the predictable times that we did things and transitioned from one activity to another. Um, Transition songs again, and oh, I, why don't I sing you the wash hands wash song, since you have the words. Wash hands, wash, wash hands, wash. When we come inside from play, we wash our hands, wash. I always repeat the last line, 
When we come inside from play, we wash our hands, wash, all done. And you can change, if you even like this idea and have a tune that you'd like to use, it can be when we're done with diapering, when we're done with potty waddy doodle whatever. You, whenever you need the, the, the hands washed, you just change the words and, and use it um, that way. Yeah. And you can see these songs, like the Washington, they're, they're not silly, but they have a little upbeat to them. Like, this is going to be fun. This is engaging. We're going to wash our hands. And we always washed with the children. We all washed our hands together. And this was, this song, you'd hear this little tune. They would just start humming it towards the end of, of uh, whatever activity it was that they knew they were going to end up with a hand wash from. Yeah. And, and you know what, what, what make, that makes me think of, Lena, is I, I, see, I see this little girl's eyes that are just sparkling, right? Just sparkling. She, whatever it is she did, whatever she's showing the adult, it, it's really engaging her heart, her mind, her emotions in every way possible. But at some point, whatever is on her hands there is going to need to come off, right? It's just the way life is. And so when our response to that is something like a song, which softens our face, which softens our voice, where we can have a little sparkle in our eye, we can match her delight and yet guide her to something that needs to be done. Is, is, am I getting it right? Is that kind of... Yes, and without, without making it a barked out order, you know, I found that when I switched to using songs for everything, my energy level was so improved. It was just so much less work for me and so much more playful for me that it was renewing instead of feeling like I had to manage all this stuff and was, was um, uh, barking out orders, which was something that I, I switched from. So um, just having a light little tune for engaging a child as you collect them for an activity that they may not be ready for or whose time it is, they may not be quite ready. It's always the most pleasant way to make the transition in my experience. Yeah. Yes, and I imagine if, if we're not used to doing that, it, we might feel a little bit self-conscious. Um, but probably I, I, whenever um, I, I talk to parents and families and people that are changing things, I always say do it in the safest way possible. You know, if there's nobody else in the room but you and that child and, uh, and you're, and you're you know, going to be a little bit brave, you know, and, and just try it and just hum a little few little, little you know, things under your, your breath and just wash, 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 wash you know just something as simple as that and then see how the child responds nobody else is looking at you no one else is going to notice if the child doesn't looks at you and it, it's not working you can stop it's you know you haven't committed to anything in a very public way um and then just bit by bit have it become part of who you i, I imagine that's what you had to do lena because you said it didn't start off that way this was something you learned to do over time well yes and um we as a group came to a decision about songs, and and uh, I had one assistant once who was very, very shy about singing, so she just sort of very quietly hummed things, whereas somebody else might blare it out. Um, everybody had their own style, but we were all in it together, so that was perhaps a little bit different than, than um, some circumstances, but because we had made this commitment to, to change, um, we all sang. Well, we'll be curious to hear if uh, if maybe some uh, some of the centers have have maybe played with this or not. But it's all part of again injecting playfulness, gentleness, softness into uh, an activity that children have to do. Yeah. 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 Well, here we are with emotions. So we're going to talk a little bit about emotions. Um, and uh, again, it's not it's not often um, that we find pictures of children crying um, because, of course, we take pictures of children. We want them to look their best. But I really appreciate this picture here because this is children 
have moments when they are upset. And we just have a lovely, lovely example here of emotions flowing out, an adult providing that comfort and that softness, um, you know, and but just letting the emotions come, giving space for it, holding, so to speak, uh, the emotions, giving space for the emotions. Um, because if if children have don't aren't able to feel that if they're if it can't go flow through them, then they won't even be able to know what it is. And then bit by bit we give it a name so then they can share with us what's going on with them, and they can continue to be aware of what's happening. And you know it hurts our hearts to see a child in distress, but distress is part of the human condition, and so we need to give it that space. Yeah. And we're talking about um, play and emotions. They're sometimes referred to in this paradigm as emotional playground. And it, it, we're going to be looking at some of those. But the most important fact to keep in mind, as Eva is saying, is that um, we are allowing emotions to be felt and expressed. And we're holding it as a container, as you see this adult doing. And when we can hold an emotion, that makes it safe. And um, this is about taking emotions, not at this age, but as the child matures. They, they are becoming conscious of their emotions, which really only happens through expression. And so part of what we're doing here is to um, promote emotional well-being through expression, holding, and naming emotions. And then at a certain point, there will be times for um, doing what we would call redirecting like uh, some of the emotions into different uh, manifestations of expression that don't harm other people, for instance. Yeah. But yeah. to make it normal, to make it normal to express emotions. Yeah, because we are we are people of emotion. Um, Dr. Neufeld likes to to remind us that the word emotion has movement in it, right? Emotion, we move, and it's only through movement that we can grow and develop. Um, and so we're going to be spending more more sessions again on how to accompany children through through their emotions um, as, as the adults who are caring for them. But one of the beauties of play is play is a space for emotion to happen right and sometimes it's yeah. some of these things that children experience uh, even the little children who can't tell us in words still have a very strong emotional reaction to things going on in their world i remember um you know talking to to uh, uh, some uh, people that were caring for very young children and there had been a tornado in in that particular community and they said is this normal our children are playing out tornado over and over and over again and I said yes of course because that is what's happening in their life that's what's happened in their life and play is a safe place to do that retelling the story figuring it out um, and integrating and digesting it especially fears of separation because of course a tornado is a disaster and different Difficult things happening in life. And uh, Lena, this is a very beautiful story of this little boy here. Yes, this idea that we have to replay um, difficult moments in life is so important. It's one of the things we see in play. And if we can make room for it and don't stop it, then somehow the edge of what could be a very difficult um, emotional experience is somewhat softened. And if something happens again, they're a little bit better prepared. So in this instance, this little boy is experiencing the birth of a sibling. And he became very um, inappropriate in the classroom. He was not able to be with other children, which if you think about it, that makes sense. He was not able to be with other children, and he had another child in his life. And this was somebody who was never that way previously. So I kept him in from outdoor time. He had separate outdoor time, and I kept him in while I was preparing the lunches. And here we see him playing with intense concentration and engagement with all of those baby dolls. And they're all getting a little place on the steps. He played that quite a few times. 
just as we tell stories to children over and over again, he needed to replay this big thing that had happened in his life, the birth of a sibling. And eventually, this is the, we can go to the next slide, Eva. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Eventually, are we there? Yes. I can't see. Huh? Yes, yes, we're there. We're there, sorry. So, so, <laughs> so here he is. This is months later. His little brother is now at the center in the infant room. And when I first put them together, the, the infant play yard is quite large, and the little boy came over, and he had nothing to do with that baby. He had nothing to do with the brother, and we just let it be. But we kept having him have a little bit of playtime in the infant yard for um, a few days. And then in the end, this is where he came. He came, he couldn't, he, he came to be with his baby brother. And there are other pictures I have where he's actually helping him with that little, it's not a cup, it's actually a little tiny um, piece of a tree limb that is between the baby's hands. And uh, his, his big brother was helping him play with it, if you will. He began to accept this brother, and of course, they became good pals eventually. But this was this was a really important way for him, the play, for him to get to this point of acceptance. We gave yeah. him the room to do that. Yeah. And I think this is something that, um, you know, more and more um, we are, you know, we're recognizing that when some children come from difficult uh, challenging home situations for a whole bunch of different reasons, um, then, you know, I, I would love to be able to to be a fly on the wall um, and just notice, just notice what it is they're engaging in, what it is that they're doing, how they are playing. And of course, some of it can be quite frantic because their alarm can be quite high. And again, we'll, we'll look at that in some of our, our next sessions. But but uh, I, uh, when I, when I work with children more in the uh, in the elementary schools, and one of the schools that I worked with were children that came from difficult home situations. And I said, they need more playtime because they need to play through all of these things that are happening to them and get some of those emotions out. Um, and so it, and, and of course, luckily the school uh, did that. So this is a wonderful example. I'm just gonna go back to that picture. Just an amazing example of a very, very young child already playing out an emotional situation. He, he wouldn't be able to tell you in any words what he's doing there, but he he's the play, serves that emotional purpose and I think that's really really important that uh, we realize for some children first they have to go there before they can do some of the other things that of course we love to see in play yes indeed that captures it so well yeah Yeah. And just a few little things that we want to you know alert you to is that is that there are times when children can um, can do things to entertain other people, but it really their play is all about what they do. Now, I, I you know you can you you're you know this story here as well, Lena, right? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. So this is that same boy, uh, as you can probably tell. So he's in he's in the room with with a friend, and um, this is inclusion. As far you know, he here they are. They are deeply engaged in this jumping uh, project, and yet they're taking space, they're giving space for the other to have a turn. Nobody taught this. Nobody demanded this. This came through their connection and engagement with the game. So I love this as an example of uh, movement from in to out and how they actually became uh, able to share, which we, of course, don't see too often at this age. Um, And inclusion, um, but the other important place to go with this is talk a little bit about performance and entertainment and how it is part of our responsibility as adults not to turn play into performance or uh, entertainment because then it's no longer in that flow place. When we comment on something, when we good job it, um, 
when we praise in a certain way. These are all things we are going to explore in more deeply is how to keep ourselves neutral in, as we are watching a play unfold. Because as soon as we go from play to performance, something is lost. Now um, I'm doing it for something outside of me. It's externally motivated because I'm getting praised or um, recognized for what I'm doing. But if we can forbear comment and let the play unfold, then it is being done wholly for the purpose of expression, something from the inside out. Expression for expression's sake. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And if you go to the next slide, yeah, expression, expression for expression's for expression sake. sake. So now yeah. he's having his turn doing doing the weeping. Yeah. Um, and, and go ahead. Well, I was going to say, and it doesn't matter whether he does it better or worse than the little girl who was before him. She looked like she was kind of a pretty good little jumper. He looks like he's not too bad either, but it doesn't matter, right? Because it's the act of jumping and landing and mastering that. That's the activity, not how good you're at it. Oh, they're so, they're so incredible um, in, in their concentration of learning this skill. And nobody is saying a word. Uh, whoever took those photos, and I'm not sure who it was, um, and then I put them together, was standing back. We, we, made, we almost hid when we took our photos so that the children didn't feel self-conscious or yeah. like they were being observed or that what they were doing was a performance. Yeah. Yeah, and and the other the other thing too, and and I'm going to um, in a moment just pass on because Sarah is going to be joining us very shortly. But um, the other piece that I think is important to mention here as well is that we are always worried about children, children's attention span, and we want them to be able to be good at paying attention. But when we allow for this kind of engaged play to happen, it happens spontaneously, right? Because they they are really concentrating here, not concentrating on necessarily what we want them to concentrate on, but the first development of concentration is to be able to do something and pay attention to it and focus on it. So it's like the early stages of something that will be useful to them later on when it becomes more other directed. But at this point, it's important for them and it does develop their ability to concentrate. Um, they have done studies where uh, in different kinds of schools, different kind of, uh, you know, um, educational settings, some which are more, um, which are more say very specifically, we do not comment on children's play. And what they found was over time that that the the less that children, children were allowed to play without any kind of comment from adults, um, you know, the, the longer they could do that, later on they showed better concentration. So it's tempting sometimes for us to want to make a comment. But actually, if the child is in that flow moment, we need to leave them in that because it, it serves the, a very good purpose in the long term. Yes, and Eva, could you go back to the um, uh, play is not performance or entertainment slide for yep. a minute? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're there. Okay, so I just noticed, so look at the boy standing, watching, very, no, no bodily action whatsoever, just waiting patiently and then look at that last slide where it's going to be his turn now look at him moving it's so <laughs> incredible he just comes to life and then there he is on the next one expression is for expression's sake uh taking taking his turn yeah. um i always tried to find to your point about not commenting eva i always tried to find the um, neutral words when an activity was completely over, perhaps it was nap time and I was going to say something about what I had noticed during the day in a very unselfconscious making way, I might say something, you worked really hard at jumping today. That's a completely neutral statement, but it is what the fact was. Something yeah. like that. To strive for neutrality in my, in my language. Yeah. So you notice the child, the that child knew that you noticed or, him. Yeah. 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 Yes. Because I mean, we, we want the children, I mean, we we're saying, you know, notice them, be there, be present for them, but in not in a way that makes them feel self-conscious about what they did or didn't do, I guess. That's right. Yeah. 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 Well, play and emotion. So here we are, art, 
dress up, pretend, music, stories. These are all ways in which we can help emotion to, to come out. So I'm going to ask Sarah now to come up and uh, I'll, um, <laughs> Sarah, I, I, you can see the slides. So I'm, I'm going to start with the dress and, and pretend. I don't, if you wanna just take it from there and then let me know when you're ready to move on to the next slide. <laughs> Oh, oh, no, I can't hear you for some reason. No, um. I can hear Sarah. Now? Yes. <laughs> okay, let's, let's remove everything that's not necessary today. <laughs> and it's about play too, eh? In a room, we don't need that much. We have our own body, which is the best things we can play with, with our voice, with a movement, and then create, you know, I can have a stick, a doll, anything I want in my hand, and then make a three years old pretend it's there and they'll see it. Uh, well, my journey into play and seeing that, well, it began with, I have a, an ama amazing father who could, um, uh, helped me into this Im imaginary world when I was really little. So for with him, I went dragon hunting and all sort of stuff. Uh, and I could re re uh, recall him picking us home uh, sometimes um, Sundays. And then he were literally asking us to go play outside with him. So, and it was amazing seeing that. So it's, I'm really grateful uh, for all the teaching he gave me without giving him, uh, give me them. So power of play, it's, it's, it's amazing. Uh, and as an adult, if you want to try to reach it, you need to practice. You need to practice to find in your heart, your, your, uh, your, ch your child heart, because every little one got it. You know, it's part of them. It's instinctive. They'll play. They will want to play all the time. But as an adult, when we grow up, well, it's, it needs practice and it's courage to play and especially in front of other adults. And uh, Eva told us that we need to practice, you know, uh, sometimes singing with the little one. And so I encourage you to, to try um, to find this area, this safe spot with your little one. I'm sure with your group, with your little one, you're way much better, much confident than with other adults. I know that because I try at the preschool gathering to do a workshop on play with adults, and it was challenging to bring them to, to play. But at the end, they all find it was really, you know, they release the tension, they feel great, and it was exactly the feeling I want them to feel. So when we realize that, well, now we, we really see the power of play. So power of play, the play should be made with no judgment, just creativity. And it's really an area where uh, you can use it to heal, you know, the little one. And just like in nature, when we go outside, we go for our walk or we go in the bush in the territory on the land. Well, Mother Nature, they, uh, she heal us, you know, we feel instantly more uh, better so the, the play it's working a little bit the same it's a safe space for the little one to heal and if you look at them and you really look at them very um, carefully you'll see what happened because you get to know them to know what happened in their life how would they feel if they're in a bad mood and then they will through play well find their own you know balance and and came back to um to an happy place or a better place. So um, uh, just a little bit about pretend. Uh, I was in a very a stranger class. They didn't know me for five or 10 minutes. And the teacher, they, they make the mistake to leave me with the group. <laughs> so I was alone with a group of five years old. Uh, they don't know me. So I get in the center of the room. And then I start pretend I'm a, a monkey. I'm a very good monkey, I have to admit. I can do the, my face and I'm making a monkey sound. <laughs> That's really amazing. So they jump on me and they try to pretend they're other animals. So in like 30 seconds, I win the crowd. I was a center of attention and we had so much fun. And after, you know, the, the more shy, well, they 
slowly joined the parade and everybody were play pretend and it was very so much fun so i encourage you to find a space to even yourself not just okay it's play time and look at the little one playing but you know pretend be someone or something you want to be and just have fun and if you lead you know this game or or pre pretend or dancing well they they will follow you and feel safe that it's a they're allowed to go even deeper and deeper into their their imagination and creativity and this is where you can reach you know uh unexpected day <laughs> and be very beautiful result with how they feel inside so uh, about maybe painting, this is a part where I really want to uh, raise awareness with you. We heard about performing, play shouldn't be about work, play shouldn't be about performing. Well, every year, two years old, they will paint like this, you know, they will uh, find their space and play, play, uh, paint or draw with their their fingers and try to and, and try they will try and if we um avoid telling them that it's oh it's beautiful or uh, they, they will want to do beautiful always after so now we want to create a space where uh they they're free to explore they're free to choose the color they want to you know work with on that day and give them space so what i want to say is uh, sometimes we don't want to do bad but uh wanted them to you know encourage them into this process we will say some things like oh it's very pretty and after they'll be like okay well what if i don't do pretty anymore what if i want to do really messy but the teacher or the educator she wanted me to do pretty so we don't create the safe space for the emotion to come out so that's why it's really important to say oh i like your choice of color oh it's very interesting today well i encourage you to go deeper in that area something like that or find your ways or just look at them if they're just working and working well let them do what they're doing they're in a good space <laughs> as an artist i can paint for hours and i don't i lose track of time and those times, they're healing time for me. They make me feel good. They make me feel like I'm in, you know, uh, another time space where uh, everything is possible. So that's very important about that. Uh, so I've seen on the uh, social media lately uh, a picture of a, a, a little one drawing and the, the, the educator were marking in red that incomplete uh, and then put a note on it. And if it's probably for four years old and they had to match, you know, the color probably with numbers and then the, the little one couldn't finish. So they told this little one, well, they fail doing, you know, and it, it makes me so sad to see that. So I hope it gives you really a strong image that play and painting and dancing and singing should not be about performance, about work, but it's all about healing, emotional expression. Uh, and it's very powerful, like I said. Uh, so about dancing and music i'm a dancer too i'm a power dancer and most most recently i'm i'm doing a, jig, a jigging class on internet <laughs> it's very late it's in bc and i'm in quebec but i'm all alone jigging with well, a group of people on the internet and then i have so much fun and this kind of music jigging it's really uh raised my energy and my spirit up because it's you know the the fiddles and then the beat it's really like it's it's fun when i'm power dancing i could dance and i'm drained absolutely drained for hours and uh, i feel this spiritual connection where i don't feel the pain at some point um so so this is a way to show you that also by dancing singing uh, drumming uh, you can reach a, a um, spiritual also connection that uh, it's hard to to do in you know every day today when we're working or we do other stuff so there's a really powerful thing into dancing uh, i heard lena said that sometimes with her singing she kind of match the mood 
So if they're, they're sad, she'll match the mood by doing like a very sad song. Well, I realize I do the, the exact same thing with my dancing. So I really, I dance very often alone in my living room. So if I feel like I'm sad, well, I kind of find that I will put more sad music and just let my body flow and move with the music. Because it's my body and to my body, my soul is healing. And I don't have to cry and, and call a friend and tell her all my problem. I just have to dance a couple of sad songs and then after well maybe i'll put a more a jigging song <laughs> and i'll feel like i raised my level of energy so maybe you can do the same if you're not a good singer maybe you're a dancer and you can do just like lena and match the energy of the group and just let and, and observe them how they react to this that song how they react to another song so and there's no uh wrong in dancing they absolutely know wrong. So everything your body want to say, well, there's a space to say through dancing. So that's the thing that I really uh, enjoy doing. And of course, I like to do it also with the little ones. Because when you do it with the little ones, they absolutely no judgment. They'll take you for what you are. And they just want you to be there and to give them this opportunity to develop to be you know free to be loud <laughs> to dance and scream and and just have a good moment of fun uh so i really encourage you to look inside and even find this moment where maybe your creativity been broke by someone and try to reconnect with that because if you reconnect with that well you will reconnect with the little one and say well i won't do that mistake of you know try to make them perform for me i just want them to make you know crazy fun play for me and with me so try to do push yourself just a little bit more and jump into the, this experience this journey of play with your little one so this is one of my you know uh, journey to play as well um I just enjoy uh, being with this little one and dancing through um, in the powers this year. I could experience and tell you that just to end uh, this uh, my my comment. Um, a lot of uh, adults they want their uh, little one to dance in the powers. Probably they don't have that chance for themselves to dance as an adult, and so they make nice regalia. And then they push them into the, the dancing circle. But those little ones, they're not ready to do that. They're shy. They, they don't know what to do. So I just love to go around. And then sometimes there are special dance for the little ones. So, uh, and then they, they, they're there and they don't want to go. Like there's 300 person looking at them and sometimes more. And then there are three or four. So, and then you can see the gap. The three years old, they don't mind. They'll go and dance four five six six now they're they're aware people looking at them if i do wrong so what i do and i i'll go i know it's the little one dance but i i they need an, an alpha dancer <laughs> to go grab their hand and start a dance with them so i'll dance a couple of step and just pretend i'm a seven years old or five years old and and then now they go now they can you know express themselves so just want to show you that your role as a leader into their play if especially if they're shy and they you know don't want to try well it's very important so, yeah. enter your play yeah. thank you so much sarah Yes, because I, again, we have to remember our children have so many emotions in them, right? There's so many things going on. We don't know. We don't know what they're bringing from home. We don't know what's happened to them, you know, just even just getting along with the other children. And so we need to give a space for this to flow through, to flow yeah. through, keep that movement happening. Eva, I, have, I called my friend uh, last week and uh, she told me her uh, five years old uh, little boy, uh, he played World War Three. So, and then she was panicking. So I, and, and thank God I heard you before hearing that the, the kids were playing COVID and now I, I, I kind of coach her that it's okay. You know, it's a, it's a way for him to make sense of everything that he cannot make sense and the stress that it hears on the TVs and everything. So thanks Eva for your coaching. <laughs> well, yes. And, and I, 
one, maybe a little bit later, I can share a little bit of what one of our Neufeld Institute uh, faculty is doing in Poland with the uh, Ukrainian refugees. And it's all about play. I have a beautiful, beautiful picture that I will share with you uh, before the end of our session today. But uh, yes, play is where those emotions can come through and we can we can you know we can provide many different ways of doing it some children it is the physical movement that will be right for them for other children it will be the the, the visual right of, of, but always open ended without judgment without an expectation i think is is for me what i think is yeah. important and this is what i'm hearing you say that's what heals your soul is that yeah yeah um yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Sarah, and and for your courage in in uh, finding your own play and then leading children to their play. It's lovely. Um, I wanted to just say a couple of things more, if I might, um, about about um, uh, dance and and music and then stories and um, circles. So I began every morning, I called it morning dancing, and um, I just had a little tune, and we would, um, all of us would just begin to dance a little bit after the parents had left, sometimes before, but usually after, as a way of bridging the separation um, with something very joyful. And children are natural movers. They're not judging themselves at that age. And so we would just dance, and I sang, morning dancing. Morning dancing. Today we're morning, morning dancing. That's all. Da 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 da. And I use that little tune all, in all sorts of ways. It's a silly little tune. But that began that began the morning. Uh, sometimes I would sing, as Sarah mentioned, melancholic songs. Uh, if somebody was having a particularly hard drop off, I would sing a song that kind of met that mood in order to um, bridge their separation. Um, but meeting, my favorite example comes under stories and circles of meeting the group where it was. We sat down for circle. Um, there's a lot of trickiness to that, as you probably know. And we always began our circles uh, with a little verse about pussycat and then um, or I rang something, and we had a little verse about the pussy cat, and then we did, as you can see in this picture on Stories in Circles, we did some finger plays. But one day, I could tell that they weren't with me, I mean, before I even began. And a child had made a comment about how everybody was grabbing things from her. And just what popped into my mind was a song by Raffi, the more we get together, the happier we'll be. And I simply changed it up to the more we get together, the grumpier we'll be because you want what I have and I want what you have. And that, that I just sang that, and they looked at me, and then these grins came out over their face, and they just howled with laughter, and I had them, and we went on. And that was just like acknowledging the truth of their experience at the moment of being together, which was, it was a bit hard. Um, so somehow finding a way to make the bridge from what you, as Sarah was saying, what you, what you feel is happening with the group and, and then capturing it and meeting it and perhaps then moving it forward a little bit. And I, I wanted to say something about stories and the themes that are in so many of the fairy tales that we tell, um, the books that children read uh, more in the grades, they're very often about survival, being an orphan, um, the wicked stepmother. These are not stories that I would recommend for really young children, but my point is that this theme of separation this greatest fear of separation comes up over and over again in the children in children's literature. Mm -hmm. And so what do we take away from this? That this is a perfect example that you can you can move to the young one's age as appropriate of how we are one we are one step removed in processing what is a deep unconscious uh, fear 
our greatest fear of separation, we process it through story, through these stories, um, through the games we play. Uh, there's the, the Corona tag. There's, um, there's Ring Around the Rosie. Uh, there's all sorts of hide and seek and peek a boo at the very, very youngest age and playing monster. These stories and games are incredibly healthy when they are conducted in a warm, safe, loving way. Yeah, you can this live. Is, this is the truth way of giving yeah. them a chance to process what is a little bit scary. It's a little bit scary, but it's not really scary because the person who you're with loves you yeah. and is attached to you. So, you they not. Eva? Yes, yes. You know, as you were saying this, you were saying a, a, a story appropriate for children this age. And, you know, I am in my 70s, and I still remember a book called The Lost Little Puppy that my parents must have read to me when I was. And, and but of course, the story goes on and how the puppy is lost and, you know, so on and so forth. And of course, at the end of the story, the, the puppy is found. But just yes. it's 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 living that emotion of oh, it's a little bit scary to be lost, but we're always children are worried about that. I remember my son, you know, looking at his dad and saying, "Are we lost? Are we lost?" So it is a preoccupation that children have. So through the story, you can talk about being lost, one step removed, but then also, yes, and you will be found. And so that you need to and, feel that little bit of unpleasantness because you're, you're thinking about it. It's already part of a child's mind. But amazing to me that, you know, nearly 70 years later, I can still remember that one story. I love that. Yes. And mine was a teddy bear that was out by itself. But thinking about the kinds of the little nursery game, uh, stories we tell, the three little pigs, the billy goat scruff, all of these are addressing fears okay? or the wolf is going to come uh, but but they always outwit see this is the key they survive it they outwit it they get through it and so in a way our psyches are playing out our biggest fears and the brain is being given the the uh, journey of how one can survive those things successfully exactly. now this is pretty, you know, I, I, some place where a lot of caution must be taken. But I just wanted to mention, to bring to the adult's awareness, that these stories are everywhere in children's literature, just so that you're now aware of that. Yeah. And you can play slightly alarming games of monster and peekaboo, depending on the age of the children, and even the um, hide-and-seek in and in the connection that you have with this child, these will be um, healing experiences for them. Yeah, for sure. A little bit scary. <laughs> A little bit scary, yes. And of course, nature. And um, Cheryl, I don't know if you have uh, some thoughts about this because I know that some of the programs uh, really do that. But I love the Thomas Berry quote is the natural world should be treated as one of the most important events in the lives of children. And we see some beautiful, beautiful pictures here, of course, how given the opportunity to be in nature is so amazing and fascinating for children. Well, to touch up on that, Eva, you know, like us as the First Nations people, you know, like everything in nature has a spirit. So, you know, part of our teachings are to work together with those spirits and not to control them. Yeah. Well, you know, we have to live with the animals and the plants and the rocks and the rivers and we have and other human beings. So we all have to work together. <laughs> and on that note, you know, like I, I listened to what you're saying and, you know, the importance, you know, for us, it's like we're stewards of the land and we need to, we're taught to protect this and to respect it. So, you know, there's some rules that are there that, you know, that you learn from, uh, from when you were, you know, a wee child, <laughs> you know, like not to throw away fish bones, like I was talking to you earlier about, but there's uses for this and we're taught to use, to reuse, to recycle, 
and to take only what you need. Yeah. You know, when you went fishing with your grandpa and he said that we're going to throw away, we're going to throw back the big fishes. Okay. You know, and you did because you wanted, he wanted more fish. And this is what he explained to you and said, we're only going to take two fish, you know? And I think and that how deep those values go, Cheryl, right? How deep they go when yeah. you're taught. Yeah. And, you know, like uh, back in the day, like we didn't have, you know, what we have today in terms of toys, you know, we had like rocks and blocks of pieces of wood. That's really all you needed, though, wasn't it? I mean, yes. look at these children here. They're play, you know, they they're they're fascinated, and we have many pictures of fascinated with this caterpillar, right? And then somebody's got a little bug there. I don't know. It looks like a little spider or something. And the other little boy is playing with a plant. And you know, it's like you don't need a lot of toys. That's right. And you know, like we didn't. And have in all cases, either. oh, I'm sorry, Cheryl. I said, we didn't have money, you know, to buy these jobs, you know, talking to, to buy these toys, because, you know, you talk about remote communities and, you know, like uh, the, we were living off the land. So now it's, it's different today, you know, now you have technology and you got all kind of, you know, gadgets. And <laughs> but I, think I wanted to get yeah, out ahead. in the photos with play and emotion. And I apologize if I'm interrupting, I can't see. So I'm just kind of barging in here, my apologies. But look at how respectful each of those pictures, how naturally, just to piggyback on what you were saying about respect, Cheryl, there's a natural respect in children for nature that we can build upon and work with. It's so lovely to see. Yeah, that's right. It's beautiful. And on that, you know, like uh, for me, like this, this respect for nature has been instilled in us from, you know, birth. And as parents, you know, like today, you know, there's so much other, um, how do you say that, other diversions, like people get diverted. And, you know, I think it's, it's what you want to see, what you prioritize. And I really love what you said, Eva, about preparing, you know, children for playing. Like people, you know, like, you know, should think more about that. But it, it, uh, there has to be some kind of thought, pre-thought process to say, well, you know what play is, is an important part of a child's uh, work. But it's not work, work. <laughs> no, it's... <laughs> Yeah, we're trying to yeah. find a right word for that right because we we it's their it's it's their it's their career it's their job it's their vocation is to play right it's what they're meant to do <laughs> and it it is and it's very compelling and it's you know it's engaging and it takes energy and it takes and you know there's it's it's very active process very necessary yeah and yeah. you know like even finger plays you know when you're playing finger plays <laughs> Uh, so many yeah i mean literally the whole day should be all about finding ways to inject play into as much as we can and then to give them the space to fill their their own time but yeah, yeah and i found out it was so much easier to transmit the language was through song ah yeah yes. that yes. that song there you maybe you know it's uh, lena but you know it's uh, in this house there is a room well, yes. so we translated that song in our community, and and it it was the words are really hard to say, you know, like you go in this house there is a room, and in this room there is a bed, and in this bed lies a little teddy bear with a very bad cold in his head. But in my language, it's one je we go on sing, paka se tagon ne bargaining ne be Marcos kitchen opposite del que at you. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful uh, like you know like that is beautiful when you listen to the words on the jam we want to sing paka se atogon ne bargaining ne be Marcos kitchen opposite del que so you have to break it up in syllables and you know and and once they just mastered that part, everybody was like, yay, I know what you're going to 
But there is, I mean, music is just such a lovely entry into it, right? Because there's a natural rhythm that you can break those words, the sounds up until they start making, yeah, oh my goodness. I might, I might actually be able to learn. <laughs> For, it will take me a long time. Cheryl, you have to be very patient. But it's just a beautiful yeah, thing. Yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> That's beautiful. Good. Well, I'm going to just uh, just finish with the last two slides. Um, again, just some of our key concepts and phrases that play is essential for growth and for emotional well-being. Um, it's not performance or entertainment. And tender emotions are bearable when expressed in the play mode. Play builds the brain's problem-solving capacity. And it's a spontaneous activity that can't be taught or commanded, but for which we need to create the conditions so that it can do the job that it was meant to do. Lena, do you want to add anything? No, I think that sums it up so beautifully, Eva. And right. um, I, I just, I'm just, I could, I know both of us could have eight sessions on just play because <laughs> it's, it's that important to. Uh, the work of early childhood, and I use that word work very loosely. Yeah. It'll come back. We'll come back in some of the other sessions as well, uh, because it is the theme that will come out. But uh, again, if some of you, I'm going to just stop sharing for a moment, but if some of you would like to share in the chat one thing, maybe of all that we said, uh, Cheryl or Sarah or Elena or myself, just something that will stay with you maybe for the next week. Um, it would be really helpful to us to get a little bit of feedback about that. So if you just wanna write something in the chat, we'd appreciate that. Or you can come open up your cameras, come on up, have a question if you have, I'd be happy to engage. Can we turn on our cameras now? Yep, yep. Because I want to see the, you know, who's here and yeah, we won't we won't put the camera part up on the recording. We'll we can take that up. We can cut that out, right? Uh, we can alter the recording there, Sarah. Yeah. Hi. Thank you. Thank you, Laurie. You want you're one of our regulars. I I recognize your name. <laughs> Hi, Cheryl. I miss your singing your songs there. When I used to work at the daycare and you'd come up to the children, you'd be clapping your hands and stomping your feet. I love that every time you would show up and do that. Yeah. Out? Right. You know, they're playing out a, a theme that's happening for them. And, and that's one other way in which the brain can resolve. I mean, I think right now the, um, you know, the war, the war that's happening in Europe, right, in, in the Ukraine, um, many of our children should be, even our older children should be going and starting to play out what that means. Now it's war and war is not a fun thing to play out. But really, if I saw an older child doing that, part of me would say, okay, there's something unresolved that he's playing out or she's playing out. Then another part of me would say, can I go and help? to make things better for that child so that, you know, but I'm not going to take the play away because the play is the safest, healthiest way for whatever that emotional thing happening to come out. But then can I work in the background so that it doesn't need to be there for them? Does that make sense to you? Yeah. It's, it's a sign. You're, you know, I, what I'm hearing you say, and I, people have said that to me, is I'm worried about this child because, and you're, so yes, it's a sign there's something not working in that child's life, but we don't take the play away. We go and see if we can fix it in the background. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And I would add, Cheryl, since you mentioned age four, did you not? Yes. But probably at four, I would not feel concerned. Eva, is that your no. impression too? No. Yeah. Well, again, some four-year-olds are living difficult things, but it's it's such a natural thing for a four-year-old to play. I mean, you're just so happy that they are still still doing it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I mean, you still may want to do what Eva's suggesting is fix things in the background if you know this is a kind of play that's working through something, some difficulty that there is a solution for. But uh, if if it's just a love of of imaginative play. 
and that seems healthy. Yeah. I just going to, I want to show you, I'm going to just do a very, very quick screen share again. Um, yeah, I don't know if you can see this. Hang on, I need to make it bigger. This is, uh, so this is one of our, our colleagues. Her name is Joanna, and she's a psychologist. And uh, refugees, of course, are pouring into Poland. And so she mobilized a group of her colleagues and friends and people that she knew to bring play to the children, to the refugee children. And one of her friends, who's an artist, drew this beautiful picture. You see the Ukrainian colors there. And what they're creating for these children is a safe bubble a safe bubble so that they can tolerate what's happening around them in the bubble of play. And of course, they've here she's done, you know, made it a little bit, um, you know, uh, an origami with the peace doves or whatever, but they didn't just leave it to that. They let the children, some of the children needed to play out, running away, being scared, you know, they need to play all that, but they created that safe bubble for them. And when you can play out your emotions, then what's happening in the world becomes less traumatizing. It becomes, it, it doesn't mean to say that it isn't a horrible thing that's happening, but somehow the brain can figure it out and bounce back from it and find a way through. And the last thing I'm going to just share again is, uh, you know, my, my own family, not uh, my, my parents and, and my aunts and uncles, they lived through the Second World War and somehow they were able to get through it. I'm reading my uncle's diaries that he wrote at that time and he doesn't write very much about his children but I can always see through his diary that he and his wife and the adults around the children were trying to keep them safe not let them worry about what's going on we'll it's okay we can handle this we'll be all right you know and that's our job as adults we're worried about what's happening but we need to say to our children we will keep you safe yeah and reminds me of uh, the Oka crisis Mm. Oh. I met, I met uh, this, this psychologist, I believe his name was John Bell Temple. Anyways, he created like an art program, you know, where children yeah. got to participate in, with art material to express that, that fear or the way they were feeling. Exactly. And once the Oka crisis was over, and if anybody's from Oka, you know, maybe, uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but this program continued for the next 10 years. Yeah. Mm. And it was really interesting how, how he brought that forward and helped the community, you know, deal with the trauma that was that happened there. Yes. And now, of course, we're aware of other traumas that's coming up and intergenerational trauma. And really, the solution is very interesting because Dr. Neufeld is being asked to speak and, and he's made a little drawing and I can't find it very quickly right now, but his drawing is an adult holding two little boxes with a, a kind of the red cross on them, you know, with the healing thing. And the two things that heal are relationship and play. Mm. And so when the more are, you know, the more we're worried about children in our communities, perhaps living difficult circumstances for any number of reasons, and there's no judgment here, the more they need to play not less, more play. Uh, at St. Raphael's school, they played, they had two afternoons of just play. This is an elementary school. Those were traumatized children and they finally realized they needed more play. You know, so I think again, um, it starts in our childcare centers, it goes into our K4, K5, but it also can go into our elementary school. That uh, art, play, expression helps the emotional healing. You know, that's where the healing comes from. Once you're healed, it's amazing what your brain can do. And I'm, I'm just going to share one more thing. I worked with people who later, Indigenous people who had an opportunity at 25 and 35 years old to come into a teacher training program. And it was amazing what they did in four years because they had a safe place to do it and they had come to a point of their own healing. The fact that they hadn't finished high school properly didn't 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 prevent them from becoming and this was in a, a community in, in northern Saskatchewan I won't mention the name but it was a very very racist community and yet the those students who did that four-year program when they came out very quickly were seen as some of the best teachers in that in that city because when you can heal you you, you can in four years you can catch up mm -hmm. I guess for me, it's a reminder, you know, of how we don't know where the children, you know, out of the homes that they're coming from, what they've experienced. 
And I think as a caregiver, you know, we have a responsibility to pay attention to that and to make sure that the, the attachment and the bonding, you know, with at least you or the primary caregiver within the center is there. Yeah. So that would, this would enable their play to, to actually uh, come out. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Give time for play. It's the most healing thing we can do for children. Uh, in Finland, I just saw another little thing about Finland yet again. Finland, they do not teach children anything about reading and writing until they're seven years old. Play, play, play in all the early years. And yet Finland has, they, they also play during the school day. They don't have any homework. And at the end of it in high school, we have, they have the best academic results. So um, again, my, my message here is play is what our children need on every level.